which a moment I can't forget because it ties into our life story. It was the very first brochure ever written and printed for One Heart. And it's interesting because as I was looking at it this weekend, it's interesting what we wrote 10 years ago. Because sometimes you look back and you see things. And today we look at what it means to celebrate the miracle of Christmas as it relates to those who were least likely to celebrate it, the shepherds. And so listen to these words, a place to call home. There's no sweeter place on earth than the place we call home. It is a place where memories are made, lives are shaped, and love is experienced. It is, it is at home that we find acceptance, peace, and refuge from the storms of life. Each of us have vivid memories of moments when our homes became a place where God will speak to us in unmistakable ways. And then I went on to quote a note that I received from a friend at that time. And listen, listen to these words. I am desperately longing to find that church home, a place where I feel loved just as I am, a place where I fit in and belong, a place where I can utilize the gifts God has given me that I have placed by the wayside for so very long. And that was the beginning of the miracle of one heart. But I want you to kind of transit back with me in time to another time where there were men who were shepherds who the reality is they had a task to do and assignment in life, but there probably were very few moments in which they had the opportunity to celebrate. And today I want you to think about that because as you open your Bible to Luke chapter 2, you find the story of shepherds. Now, as you're looking there, you will discover that this is an amazing story because it does open our eyes to what it is we need to see in light of the Christmas season in which we enter. And when you think about the intense commercialization of this particular window of time, when you think about that, that we have now come to an arena where they have to open up stores on Thanksgiving night instead of being thankful all day and night, they have to open those stores up in order for people to spend more money. You realize very quickly that sometimes people miss the very message of what celebration is really all about. And today I want to ask you a question, because it really will set the tone for everything we see today. I want to ask you this question, what do you celebrate in life? What are the things that you celebrate that mean the most to you, that stand out with the greatest magnitude, that amplify inside and reverberate inside of you? where you hear them with distinction. Because the reality is, you'll discover that for the shepherd, and what I want you to see today is this, by the time you get to the culminating part of the story of the shepherd, their lives were never the same. They celebrated from that point on until they saw Jesus face to face post-death. What you discover about these men was God chose unlikely people to do that. But it was centered in their willingness to obey no matter what. And what I want you to think about today, as you think about this Christmas, could it be that God intends for all of us to be reminded that as we live a life of obedience, something begins to open up inside of us. Something begins to get transformed. And then all of a sudden, we encounter life the way God intended. Because what you're going to discover is this. The shepherds could have said, I'm not going to make that two-mile trek. Even though the angels had showed up, even though they had seen so and heard something that challenged their heart, they could have said, I'm not going to go the extra mile. I'm not going to take that extra step. But they didn't. Because they knew what they wanted to celebrate. They wanted to celebrate something that would transform their lives forever. And what I want to see today is this. When it comes to the message of what we're about at Christmas time, Christmas is all about Jesus. All about who he is, how he works, what he does. And so, as a result, these shepherds found themselves in a place where they really had to look at life from a perspective that was different than they ever anticipated because their task was so menial. In other words, they had to do the same thing over and over and over again. And I'll never forget, during my early years of life as a senior in high school, my first job uh, after my first year college was in a factory. And it's not to say that factory jobs are not important, they are. They, they fuel so many things. But I can remember sitting there, and I did the same exact task for eight straight hours every day. And I was young back then, and I thought to myself, man, I've got to do something else in life. And I look back at that, and by the time I had finished my second year college, I worked at another factory, and, and I realized that maybe I could do something else in life. And so I ended up in a church 
uh, in a really large, amazing church. I just got to speak in my heart, but I never dreamed that Bailey Smith and Bill Bryan and others would ever have the confidence to say, hey, you come work with us. But God opened that amazing, miraculous door. And I still celebrate that because I think about what kind of faith those men had to have to take me. I mean, it's like, I mean, I, I went home that day and I told my wife, I said, you won't believe this. And I had had, had a, a friend who had told me, to, you're never going to really get to do anything in any church of any size because you just, you say, look at your background. And I remember thinking, well, I mean, there's a lot of people in the Bible that have bad background. And I still got used to them. And so I can remember that day I went home and told my wife, you know what, you don't believe what God's doing. And through these last almost 40 years, God has been faithfully guiding the steps of our journey of faith. So the shepherds, we don't know how long they've been with the sheep, how many years they have done that task. But can you imagine how they spoke to the sheep differently once they looked at that baby in Bethlehem? See, what I want you to see today is in this particular passage, it does open our eyes up to moments that stand out as miraculous. And what I want you to see is that Christmas is the story of the miraculous birth of the Son of God. And see, if you see Christmas the right way, then you won't get caught up in things that don't matter. You won't find yourself all caught up in things that don't get you anywhere. You instead will find yourself celebrating how amazed you can be at what God has done inside of your heart and life. So look at this Luke chapter 2 and look with me because I want you to see a couple of things. First of all, I want to highlight two verses just to kind of bring to your attention. If you would, verse 10, Luke chapter 2. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I'll bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people, for everyone. And what you see there is, is everybody gets a chance to experience the blessing of what Christmas is about if they understand what the story is all about. But if you don't understand the story, then it all gets caught up in something that can't take you where God intended. And so as a result, they, when, when the angels show up, they said, do not be afraid. The angels said, don't, don't let this get you. Just hang tight because you're getting ready to see something that's going to make you so joyful. So joyful. And as a result, this story unfolds. Look on with me if you would. Because then you'll see in verse 15, <coughs> they say, when the angels had gone away from them in, into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. Now, imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment, you go from a dark moment out in a field to all of a sudden experiencing the majesty of God. I mean, all of a sudden, everything transforms before your very eyes, and you go, wow. And what is it, what's interesting is their action point is, let us go straight to, let us go straight to Bethlehem. In other words, here's what they said. We'll make sure the sheep are taken care of. They're in this herd, but in this flock. But what, we, what are we going to do? We're going to move. And what we see today is this. When we have life, we need to be moving. We need to be accomplishing what it is that God intends. And so as a result, the shepherds went and they experienced I mean, Look if you would, on over. You know, if you see one of the verse, look at verse 20. The shepherds went back, glorifying <coughs> and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. Now here's what I want you to think for a second. I want you to think about what it was like when they were walking straight to Bethlehem and what it was like when they walked back home. When they were walking to Bethlehem, you can imagine, they were walking fast and let's go straight, let's move quickly, let's go see what it is. But when they got there, can you fathom what happened inside of them? I mean, what, they got to see something they never dreamed they would and they, they looked at it and said, wow, look at this. Can you fathom what's going on here? And as a result of that, as a result, the Bible says that they went back and, and, and I love how this verse says it, that they went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and said. What happens here is they get to the point where they are absolutely ecstatic about something that could never come any other way. And so today, if you think about that, here's what I want you to think about. That this miracle that God has for us is something that is put together by him to teach us about how to celebrate. Because... The most, watch this, the least likely got to experience the most amazing. And that's exactly how God works. Oftentimes, he takes the least likely and does something so amazing they're astonished by it. It's really the story of our church, the story of all of our lives. That God does, he takes the least likely and does something amazing with it. And so, as a result, you discover something about what the shepherds discovered regarding life. And watch this carefully. Moments, watch this, moments are ce of celebration are always reserved for those who live a life of obedience. 
Now, when you think about it, it is inside of those, mo those moments where all of a sudden you go, you know what, I'm going to do it no matter what. I'm going to trust him even though it doesn't make sense. I'm going to step into this. And as a result, you get to, because you obey, you have something to celebrate, something to, that, that governs over your heart in such an amazing way. I'm so thankful that, that uh, our son is in church today uh, because I can remember when One Heart started, we were not in a good place with our son. Uh, he had been in a, in a choice of pattern of life that was not healthy, was not wise, did not take him where he was supposed to go. And I can remember, I can remember it was the early days of One Heart uh, that, that this all was transpiring. And I can remember thinking, the only way we make it through this is somebody helps carry the load. Somebody helped carry the burden. And uh, we were at a Valentine's event at our church. The first Valentine's we had together. And my wife shared the story of what we were enduring, what we were going through. And from that moment on, God began to give us moments to celebrate. And how I thank God that at 30 years old, at 30 years old, that the privilege of being able to see him not not drinking, not doing drugs, not smoking, instead loving his son, loving his wife, loving his family. Every time he walked into our house, I never take it for granted. And I can remember, I can remember in the dark moments when his life was not in tune, how we kept obeying, even though it didn't make any sense or did we have any idea that the story would turn out like it was. Here's what I want you to see. You don't know what's around the corner, but you know who's standing there waiting on you. And his name is Jesus. Always remember that. Always remember he's there for you. And as a result, these shepherds, you can imagine, they see what happens and they start going, wow, wow, we've got to go, we've got to go quickly. But here's what I want you to see as well. When God bursts a vision, he always leads you to victory. You see, uh, I have lots of friends. One of, one of my friends in Luther, California now, is named Rudy. And I'll never forget, uh, when our early days of the church, one of the things he and uh, he would say, Pastor, I always admire your vision and your faith. And you know what I've discovered about life? Is that if he gives you a vision, if all of hell comes against it, it can't stop. God will guide through it and will lead you to victory. It doesn't mean it won't be challenging. But, but what, here's what I want you to see. The reason we sometimes don't experience all that God intends, we don't ask him to show us anything. We don't ask him to give us a vision of something that could be miraculous and overwhelming. So we say, Lord, I'm going to give you all the glory to this. Here's what I want you to think about today. What would happen if everyone in the room said, you know what? I'm going to believe him as this next year unfolds for something that only he can do. And I'm going to ask him to give me a vision for that. I'll tell you what you discover. You discover that he would begin to work inside of you in such an amazing way. What I want you to see today is this. It is not your vocation that directs your pathway to victory. It is your vision. Because if you center your heart just on what you do, what's it? You may forget who he is. But if you center your heart in who he is, then he'll speak to you in clear and definitive ways. And if you're here today, and Jesus has never been invited into your heart. You've never said, Lord, I want you. What's it? Every vision begins with him. And it begins with you saying to him, I want you in my life. So if you're here today, and let me say this, maybe you had religion, maybe you've been to lots of churches, maybe you've been raised a certain way, but you're sitting in church going, oh Lord, I've never said Jesus, I need you to come to my heart because I'm a sinner. I need you to be a part of my life. Listen, that's what sets you in motion. It's what gives you a fire to live. <coughs> it happened to me, it happened to everyone in this room that's given a heart to you. If you're here and you've never done that, you want the greatest Christmas gift you could ever get, let him come live inside of you. Amen. amen. Because if he lives inside, amen. You can clap your hands and leave the baby in the way. When you have him as the gift, you know something begins to happen inside of you. You wake up with an energy you couldn't get in the other way. You have a direction that speaks to who you are. It's interesting. I was with a friend and he was sharing me recently about this whole idea of how important it is that we live out our story. Listen. Our story begins and ends with Jesus. He is the one who is the author and finisher of our faith. He writes the story. He motivates us to live it. And then we get to testify to what he's done as a result of it. So if you're here today and you say, man, I just need a story. Listen, 
Jesus can give you a story so amazing you blow your mind. It can move you forward. So here's what I want you to see today. Just watch what happens as a shepherd begin. And in verse 8, you see the beginning of this story. I want this story to unfold where you see and let the light shine on, on your life so that you see what it's really all about. Here in verse 8, watch what happens. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Which meant they never let go of their son. And what I want you to see today is this. They were waiting on their opportunity to celebrate, but how were they positioned to be able to celebrate? They waited on this opportunity because they stayed faithful. Watch this. Watch this. It's really clear. They stayed faithful to the calling God had placed on their life. In other words, they had a task to do, and they stayed faithful to it. And what I want you to see today is this. What we must do as members of this church, as people who are part of the body of Christ, as those who are part of the kingdom's work, we need to be faithful to what it is he's called us to do. We need to be faithful in that. And, if it, and how it shapes up, listen, it shapes up by us realizing something. Sunday is not the day to go to the ball, mall. Sunday is not the day to lose focus on who he is. It is the day to celebrate who he is. And what happens here is these shepherds, they're out in the field. And they are, they're positioned about two miles away from, from uh, Bethlehem. And they're there, but they're, they're faithful to the calling. I want to encourage you to be faithful to the calling God placed on your life. I mean, what is that calling? It's it, it is his signature on your heart. And let me tell you, when he signs on your heart, Jesus, he always signs with the blood that was shed on Calvary. Amen. I mean, it's a great signature. You can't forget it. You can't ever let go of it. But not only were they faithful to the calling, but also were waiting. And all likely they were waiting for the wonder of what it was that life is all about. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I wait for the wonder of certain things. I wait for the wonder of when my grandchildren will give their heart to Christ. I wait for the wonder when other children in our church will give their heart to Christ. And, and I'm so blessed that one of the, those children in our church will be baptized on the 20th when we have communion, of course, and, and baptism. And what I, what I want you to see is this. When you wait for something... That's wonderful. It is always a greater anticipation. And what these shepherds did, they waited. They waited knowing something was going to happen. But when they finally found out what the story was all about, the Bible says they started acting in obedience. So I want you to think about your life today. Now, put a snapshot together. Are you faithful to your calling? Are you living out what it is that God has for you? Are you waiting for the wonder of Christmas? Are you waiting for the wonder of what Jesus can do? And as a result of that, do you act in obedience when he gives you that vision? Sir, when God says to you, hey, I need you to do this. Let me ask you a question. If he asked you to do something you never dreamed he would, what would your answer be? I mean, think about it. The, the likelihood is that, and think about this going back to the biblical time, the shepherds, they couldn't just leave all their sheep there. They had to, have, they had to make arrangements. They had to either have somebody else stay there. Now, think about this. If you're one of the shepherds who just heard the angel speak and you've just heard this amazing sound, and all of a sudden the other shepherds say, Will you stay with the sheep while we go to Bethlehem? And I, I've got a feeling that would not go over very well. And I'm going to tell you something. If Gabriel shows up at your house this afternoon, I promise you're going to run to where he is. You're going to experience what it is God has for you. And so all of a sudden, what I want you to see today is this. This story has the same application today as it did back when the shepherds went to see Jesus. And it start, all starts with an opportunity that's put before them. And this opportunity was to celebrate what only God could do. But it doesn't stop there. Look what happened. All of a sudden, verse 9, an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. They were terribly overwhelmed with fear. But the angel of the Lord said to them, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all for all people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. I mean, can you imagine? Can you... Can, just, my wife and I, we, don't you say, my wife and I, we listen to music, uh, and if I don't like a song, I cut it off in the middle of the song, now, when we're getting ready for church. My wife wants to always hear the whole song, and so I always know it kind of gets me tight, 
when I when I cut one off. But if I hear something I don't like, I'm done with that song. And so, um, told you the difference between her first and mine. So this morning, there was this really amazing song that actually came out of the War Room movie. And uh, but I was drying my hair while it was going, so I couldn't quite hear it. So I stopped it in the middle of the song. He said, "Why'd you do that?" I mean, instead of saying, "Oh, honey, I love you," it was, "Why did you do that?" And that wasn't quite come, but um, the, I said, I want to hear the whole song. And it's interesting what happened. She went from, uh, from attack mode, because she was going to get me for cutting her song off, right, Cindy? To, to, oh, my husband wants to hear the whole song. And it was amazing how it transitioned uh, from that, but because of the motive of what I was trying to do. And here's what happens when those shepherds heard this song. All their fear disappeared. And they started taking action. And here's what I want you to see. God, God has written a song for every one of our hearts. And when that song is played in our hearts, we let our fears be set aside and we become something amazing. Amazingly connected to God. So what happened to them, though, these shepherds, they were really, really afraid. They were really afraid. So I want to show you three principles that you can apply to your life as you think about how fear and other things have hold of you. Because here, all of a sudden, the Bible says they were terribly frightened in verse 9. And then the angel said, verse 10, do not be afraid. First principle is this. Fear can never rule over faith. Fear can never rule over faith. You can't let your fear get in the way of what it is God intends to do. And if you're here and you never let him become the gift that changes your life forever, you'll realize something. Fear is a dominant characteristic that always attacks those who don't have a faith to stand on. And so I, I, when, when the shepherds get, get afraid, the, the very first command is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do let this fear get a hold of you. But it's not just that principle. Also, you look at it and you go, they could have been very anxious. And what I want you to see today is this. The calming aspects of how God works in our life. Because when you think about this principle, anxiety that comes at us can never rule over the affirmation that comes to us. I mean, we sometimes get anxious about things. We wonder about this, wonder about that. And watch this. All of a sudden, he starts affirming himself. He starts affirming who he is, what he's about, what he wants to do. And as a result, we start saying, Lord, you know what? I can sense you in this. I know you're with me. I know you're watching over this. And what I want you to see today is this. When we get anxious, what happens? We let fear become a dominant feeling versus allowing the presence of God to affirm that he's with us no matter what. So if you get anxious at times, let go of that. Let go of that. Because you know what could have happened? The interesting thing is, the shepherds could have had a panic attack. Right? I mean, they could have gone, oh my goodness. Panic. I have a claustrophobic kind of feeling when I get on an airplane, so I never sit in the window and uh, be in the middle is like beyond description. And so, uh, I can, I'll never forget when I was flying and they put me in the, in the wrong seat. They changed my seat. And, and, and I said to them, you know, I, I, mean, I appreciate you doing this, but this is not going to work. And the women's not work. I said, well, if you want a guy screaming and yelling like a baby, leave me in this seat. I'll never forget the reaction. Just a moment, sir. We'll find you another seat. And it's interesting because I want you to think about this a second. That moment of feeling that's connected to panicking. You ever had one of those in your life? Not related to some emotional reaction, but instead to life. What happened, shepherds, they could have panicked, been anxious, but they, they didn't do that. They Instead, they started applying the principle. And what I want you to see today is one other thing. Because this is what happened to these shepherds. Because if you'll notice in verse 16, it says, They came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph. Now, can you imagine how fast they moved? And I'm going to tell you, if I can think of one thing that's most important for our journey of faith, we need to be movement. And you hear me saying this for now two or three weeks. Let me tell you why. It is so easy to sit and soak and miss what it is God has for us. It's so easy to say, man, I, I, my life is doing a lot better now. I don't need to get hung up on anything. Move and experience. Get on the edge of what it is God wants to do. Because what you see here is they got, they, they could have said, hey, you know what? This, this walk, who wants to walk two more miles? We've been walking with these sheep all day. We finally got it wrapped up. And here's what I want to see by way of principle. Never allow distractions to rule over direction. <coughs> Don't let things distract you. Don't let things get in the way of who you are. Because when you let those distractions come, something begins to happen inside of your journey of faith. 
So think about it for a second. You ever been afraid? You ever found yourself distracted? You ever found yourself anxious? And I promise you, you've lived very long, you have. Then all of a sudden, he comes in and begins to speak to your heart. Which, by the way, the most profound way to deal with fear, anxiety, and distraction is read the Bible. And read the Bible, and if you read it, something begins to happen. And so as a result, the shepherds, they go and they move fast to see what it is God intends. So watch this in your mind if you're thinking about where we're going today. Here are, here are men least likely who are chosen by God to celebrate the most amazing thing. They get to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And as a result of that, they find themselves moving to Bethlehem to be able to experience it. But they have to be able to overcome their fear, they have to overcome their anxiety, and they have to overcome their distraction. And I can tell you right now, when you think about it, fear is a tool the adversary uses, anxiety is a tool the adversary uses, distraction is something that he uses. And all of a sudden, they overcame all those things and began to experience life the way God intended. And what happened? They moved on. And look if you would, what transpired in verse 18. And all who heard it began to wonder at the things which were told them by the shepherds. Which, if you, you realize, in verse 16, when they came in a hurry to the manger, they started talking about it. And let me tell you, you want to overcome all of the negativity of the culture we live in, where everything is centered in what transpires about this terrorist thing or that thing. Let me tell you how to overcome it. Speak of Jesus. Speak of him. Start talking about who he is. And I'm going to tell you, when you talk about who he is, something happens around you. Lift his name high. Which, by the way, it's not by accident. It's not by accident that God is at work in a nation I can't name because it also risks people's life and in their story. I'm going to tell you, in the least likely places, the most amazing things are happening because the gospel of Jesus penetrates anything that comes up against it, any, even those who are radical Islamists or whatever. Jesus does something amazing. He changed lives. And so all of a sudden, here they are, and, and Mary, you'll notice in verse 19, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. I want you to imagine for a moment, here is the one thing that she had waited on since the day she was told she would bring into the world the Son of God. <coughs> the treasure of his birth. Can you imagine when she looked at him, don't you know she still remembered what she was told in the beginning? That you have been chosen by God to do this? And as she held him, don't you know? I mean, think about it for a moment. There's no doubt in my mind that what went through her mind was all the amazing aspects of this great treasure that God had entrusted so clearly and entrusted so clearly to them. For Joseph and Mary, their lives would never be the same. But for Mary, it was a treasure that captured her, captured her attention. And I was watching this morning, and we've got several of our ladies who are, who are uh, great with child, and the children will be coming uh, soon in the days to come. And uh, I was watching them as they were maneuvering. A couple over here I saw, and not to pick on Ann or anybody else, but I was watching them. Uh, well, well, before church started, and uh, as they walked in, I thought, you know, when they hold that baby, they're going to be holding the treasure and trust to them by God. So no doubt for Mary, she she held that. Whether it, whether it's Heather or whether it, it's Amy or whether it's Kathy, whoever, they're going to hold the treasure. And so Mary treasured it, but she, it didn't stop there. I want you to see the, the climax of the entire story. Because when you get to verse 20, all of a sudden, it all comes together. Because in this last verse is the impact of a miraculous encounter that caused the shepherds to celebrate the rest of their lives. And watch this carefully. There are only a few things in life that should celebrate your entire life. Your salvation, the miraculous encounters you have with others who come to know Jesus, the moment in which he intervenes in your life and you know it's the hand of God at work. You remember those moments. Lots of other things, they disappear. Some of the days that we live, some of the experiences we encounter, the business deals that we've transacted, the, the challenges we've encountered with our hard break. We don't remember a lot of that stuff. But we do remember the things that matter the most. And what I want you to see today is this. These shepherds would never forget this miraculous encounter 
And I guarantee this, when they went back to their flock, I promise you, they were never the same. And what I want to see today is, we, in, in which we enter this month, in which we celebrate Christmas, it is my prayer we'll never be the same. Not just because the effort put into making this room come alive, but for the effort we put into making our hearts come alive. Because for these two, two, two shepherds, two things happen. Their lives were changed forever. This verse makes it very clear. They told all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. Which meant they, they could recount exactly what transpired. And watch this carefully. There are some things you don't have to worry about remembering. Certain things are not relevant. Where you put something in time may not be that important. Where things are that you have set aside, that, that may not, let me tell you what is important. It is important to remember what God's done in your life. It's important to remember what it is he says to you. That's why I encourage people, when you find a verse he speaks to your heart, mark it. Because you may come back to some of those minutes where it really speaks to me. Let me tell you what Christmas does for me. It reminds me that what the shepherds did was they didn't just remember that their lives would be changed forever. They went away glorifying God. And what, what the Bible says here is that they went away bringing great glory and praising God. And here's what I want you to realize. Who would God choose to glorify him? But those who realize that all the glory came back to Jesus. And what I want you to see today is this. All glory rests upon him. Isn't that a great thought? I mean, don't you rejoice when you think about all the glory of God resting on him instead of someone else or some circumstance or some situation? Resting on him. And the glory that they experienced, they could never, they could never, ever forget and it's, 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 when you get to that point, something begins to echo that you and I can't miss. He chose the most unlikely. He chose the most unlikely to end up being the ones who brought the greatest glory to God. I mean, he chose these people so that they would guarantee that his glory would go to Jesus, not them. They didn't come in and say, hey, look at my portfolio. They didn't come in and say, guess what I accomplished? They didn't come in and say, guess what school I went to? Listen, these people were uneducated, disconnected, set aside, which, by the way, the reason they were set aside is because they operated, they could not operate on all the rules created by religion. Because religion said you have to do this, 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 and this. But they had to take care of sheep seven days a week. So they couldn't do it. And what I want you to see is this. When he takes the most unlikely person like you or me, he does it because he knows that we're going to bring glory to God, not glory to ourselves. Because the truth is, we know this, and us both know this thing. But what he does is the most amazing and miraculous thing you could ever imagine. So today, as you think about that, I want you to come back to this thought of what happens when you celebrate. And all of a sudden you go, you know what? God has a vision for me. And let me just say this to you. If you will listen he will write it on your heart. My question for you is very clear. Do you, in your life, how clearly do you see the vision he has for your life? Because I'm going to tell you what I believe. As we, as we quickly, quickly, quickly move to the return of Jesus, as we anticipate that return, 2016 should not be a year in which we miss glorifying him, in which we miss serving him, in which we disobey what his direction is, in which we allow our fear to rule. And I want to challenge you today, if you, if you understand that God's speaking to your heart, follow him and watch what he does. And maybe you're here today and you realize you need to take a step. You need to step into what it is God has for you. If that's the case, I want to encourage you to step into that arena. It doesn't make any sense to you, but you know God's speaking to you. And how do you know that? When he speaks to you, it's a voice like no other. And when he speaks to you, it changes your life forever. I'm praying to speak into your heart this very moment. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that there are men and women, boys and girls in this room who are hearing your voice. They are making a choice to follow you. I pray in a special way that you speak to their heart, move in their life, and cause them to encounter you on this very day. If there's someone here, Lord, who's never given their heart to you, that is the greatest Christmas gift they could ever have. And so if there's someone here who needs to make that choice, I pray you speak to their heart to do it this very day. I ask you to move in lives in Christ's name. Amen.
They're doing a wedding, so I think they're just kind of clearing out stuff. Oh. Not just 